intelligencesquared.com. Please now, now welcome Anne Atkins, who's a novelist, a journalist, and uh, we all know her from that extremely uh, 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 religious slot, the um, thought for the day on the Today program as a broadcaster. Anne, thank you very much. You have nine minutes. Well, I have to say when Alain started, I wondered which side he was batting for because he seemed to be saying that religion treats us like children. It engages us in mindless repetition, expects us to be um, in need of psychotherapy. So I, I think he's done us rather a lot of favours. And what I want to say is that I agree with him. Um, the obvious way to take this debate is to look at all the bad things religion's done on one side and all the good things it's done on the other and weigh them in the balance and, you know, inquisition, witch hunts, whatever. Uh, on that side, on this side, hospitals, schools, orphanages, and look at the history of these things and weigh them up and at the end of it say, has religion, be, has religion been a force for good or bad? On balance. There are a number of difficulties with this approach. One thing I think it'd be rather... Uh, tedious and extremely inconclusive because you get involved in all sorts of uh, trivial debates like were the Crusades wars of religion or imperialism, um, you know, and to do that you'd have to get inside the medieval mind and work out the difference and all sorts of things. Uh, th th there's another difficulty with it which is that it tends to be extremely patronising. You know, relig religion is great for the masses, the people who would otherwise be rioting, but I'm much too intelligent for that sort of thing. It just, you know, keeps, stops people voting for, you know, socialist or whatever. The, the main difficulty with this approach, though, is that it completely misses the point. I want to take us on a slightly different journey, which is that it seems to me the history of Judeo-Christianity, which is where I'm coming from, is the history of the utter failure of religion over thousands of years. In fact, more than thousands of years. It starts at the very beginning with the archetypal man and woman, the microcosm of the human race, in the ideal, you know, the vision of the ideal, with an open, intimate, unrestricted friendship with God. And what gets in the way? Religion. Don't do that, they're told. That's what religion's basically about, isn't it? As Alan said, ritual, how you behave, all that sort of thing. They get that wrong, and it destroys their relationship with their creator. And then you go on to the next generation, Cain and Abel. What happens? Abel's religion's better than Cain's, so what does Cain do? He murders him. The worst crime there is. And it, it, it's because of religion. And that is the history throughout the Old Testament. Let's fast forward to what I think is the most, probably the most shocking account in the whole of Scripture. And Scripture has some pretty shocking accounts, which is the story of Abraham and Isaac. Now, I, you will know the story of Abraham and Sarah, many, many years of Sarah's barrenness, and Abraham was promised this extraordinary blessing through his descendants, but he had no descendants or no legitimate descendants. And then in old age, Sarah gives birth to a son, and God says, I want you to take your son up onto a mountain and kill him in a religious sacrifice. What a terrible thing to contemplate. And Abraham doesn't do what Sarah would have done and say, sod off, you know. Abraham actually does it. Now, just to put this in context, Abraham was living in a time when this was not that unusual. Baal worship involved child sacrifice, as did quite a lot of pagan religions, because the whole point is you care so much about your religion, you will do anything. You will sacrifice your child, a baby. And Abraham takes his son up to the mountain, he deceives his servants, he deceives his son, he builds an altar, he puts a fire on it, he ties his child up on that fire, and he draws out the knife to kill him. And God says, stop. This is not what it's about. It is not about religion. And you get this over and over again. I mean, I believe, I find this a, a troubling and fascinating account. And I believe it's that dramatic because it's that important that God is having to teach us that it's not about religion. It's about a relationship. And all the way through, religion is destroying relationship with Adam and Eve, with Cain, with his brother, with, with Abraham, with Isaac, that's what would have happened if God hadn't stopped it. Uh, you get the same with, well, we're, with Moses comes down from the mountain and they're involved in a religious ceremony. And, you know, Moses says, for goodness sake, I can't leave you for five minutes. You get stuck in religion with a golden calf, you know. And, it, and, and I could give you numerous examples. I'll just read out a couple. Um, 
from Samuel. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? No. To obey is better than sacrifice. It's the relationship, not the ritual. Uh, or from Isaiah. Is this the fast I've chosen? Sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you think is acceptable to God? No. Do away with injustice. Feed the poor. And then this wonderful passage at the end of this. Then your light will break forth like dawn. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You'll cry for help and he'll say, here am I, a relationship. And then most dramatic of all, the Lord says, all this, relation, all this religion over hundreds of years has failed. The old covenant has failed. The time is coming when I will make a new covenant. No laws, no commandments. The laws will be in your heart. Because I've been like a husband to you. And I'm going to make a new covenant, covenant when everybody, nobody will teach religion, but everybody will know me, God says. That's what it's about. So that's the gist of the Old Testament. And then the New Testament, what happens? God comes to earth as man, and a man who hates religion. Almost the first thing he does in John's Gospel, he goes into the temple, he sees everybody obeying their religion, selling these animals for sacrifice, the only time we see Jesus violent, he throws over the tables, he destroys other people's property, he makes a whip and he drives them out because he hates religion. The religious people of his day were the Pharisees. They were good people. They obeyed the religious laws. They did the right things. What's he call them? Whited sepulchres, vipers, snakes, hypocrites. A terrible thing to say to religious people. But Jesus hated religion. Um, <coughs> the story of the Good Samaritan is the story of <coughs> religious people, the priest, the Levite, walking away on the other side because their religion said you mustn't touch a dead body. And it's somebody outside the religion who shows love, who shows the relationship. Um, St. Paul, whom people think of as a dry old stick, hated religion so much that most of the book of Galatians is about St. Paul saying you don't need circumcision. You can eat anything now. We've done away with religion. We don't need the law. We now have love. We now have the love of God. We now have a relationship with God. Or this um, in Colossians. Don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink. For regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, a Sabbath day. These are a shadow. The reality is Christ. And what's the last thing Christ does? He's dying on a cross and a terrorist, or two terrorists actually, uh, almost certainly murderers, dying with him. And one of them says, <clears throat> remember me when you come into your kingdom, this guy hasn't got a religious bone in his body. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Nothing to do with religion. Now, you and I, everyone in this room, faces the same future, all of us. Believe me, friends, on that day, all the religion in the world is going to be no use to you whatsoever. When you face your maker on the day of judgment, and he says, hello, why should I let you in? And you say, I went to church. He's not going to be impressed, because that's not what it's about. What's going to matter on that day is who your friends are, or more specifically, who your friend is. Now, um, <coughs> this is a, a, a fun topic for a debate, and I hope you have a good evening, but it's not really very important, is it? Whether the world needs religion, it doesn't really matter one way or the other, and to be perfectly honest, I don't really care which way you vote. But there is something that matters very much. How you vote tonight won't make the slightest difference to the world. It really doesn't matter whether or not the world needs religion. But there is one question that could change your life. Not does the world need religion, but do I need God? So if that was uh, Anne agreeing with Alain, I'd like to hear her disagreeing with Alain. Um, <laughs> what, what, um, in other words, that was the argument for God against religion. Um, Grayson. Yes, uh, Anne, um, I was a bit mystified by that, really, because you, I was waiting for you to actually address the motion. And then you seem to be using, you seem to be distancing yourself from religion there, like it was like a hot potato. Yeah. You, know, you and Jesus and all the other people in, were distancing 
And um, I get the feeling, you know, you wouldn't even know about God and Jesus if it wasn't for religion. Because that's, what, that's the thing that's carried that message down through all the millennia. Okay, well then we get into a, a definitions, don't we, Rayson? I mean, Alain defined religion as ritual. Yeah, but and it's I all those that's... rituals, that repetition that he mentioned. Right. That's what made, that's what kept the story of God constant, you know, whatever. No. However... Well, okay, we don't agree on definition then. I see religion as, God's at- as man's attempt to reach God, which is absolutely futile. You're talking about them as if they're separate people. Who? God and man. Like there's some separate bloke up in the sky. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, it sounds to me like you, you, you don't like any religion apart from what you believe in. I don't like any religion at all. What, none of it? No. But surely what, you, what you're talking about is, you know, is religion, believing in God. You're, you can't no. separate the rituals out from the... From yes, I believe you can. I don't think Jesus had any time for rituals at all. He had relationships. But what's instilled your belief are those rituals. Well, what, what has instilled my belief is the relationship he had with his friends and what they wrote about him and what has been passed but down to me. But reading that is a ritual. No, I don't think it is at all. That's not. Was it like not. reading a novel? No, look, if you read about the discovery of America, that's not religion. That's what somebody has told you, what he has experienced. That's what I've read. What people have not experienced. many people read the Bible for pleasure, do they? Oh. <laughs> I certainly don't read it for religious purposes, oh. I can tell you that. Um, Hello. Yep. And I, I, I wanted to ask whether you, you feel that all religious rituals are wrong, or whether they're by the by, or whether they're more capable of corruption <coughs> than other things. And, and if so, I mean... Would you want to throw out religious art, religious architecture, the study of scripture, um, the singing? The, I mean, it, do you want to do away with all that? How, what's your relationship no, okay, with all that I, stuff? I, I, you... I see religion, well, I'm repeating myself now, religion as man's attempt to reach God. And that is futile. We cannot do it. We're not, you know, we are too puny. What? So, okay, you talked about Bach. Bach wrote the most exquisite music out of his love of God and his belief in God. That, that isn't religion. Yeah, but how come there's not many good religious artists nowadays? Oh. Most religious stuff nowadays, most religious art and music is a bit duff. But look, this is totally beside the point. Whether it's good or not, you know, is, is irrelevant. The question is, what, the question is, can I have a relationship with my maker? What, what do you think gets in the way? I mean, if you're saying religion's the sort of bad guy, the rigid, um, it's, you know, it's the letter, not the spirit, etc. What do you think it is within human beings that keeps corrupting what should be this pure, as you put it, relationship to God? Why, why, why does it keep going wrong? Well, because, <laughs> you're asking a very basic question here, because of sin, because I am created good, but I do keep making bad choices. So, you know, everything, uh, everything that's good, I am capable of spoiling, and I do. I mean, I, I, I spoil relationships in all sorts of but ways. But what's the, what's the particular nature of that spoilation, as it were? What, what is it? Is it, well, is, bad, is it being it's formal? Choi- it's being... bad choices I make. No, no, but in relation to, to religion, what you're calling religion, okay, in relation uh, is, is it being to religion, too rigid? Or what, what is it? Uh, in relation to religion, basically, I think it's a mistaken independence. It's a... Uh, going back to the, uh, where I started with this um, wonderful explanation of w- uh, the human condition, the, 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 the picture story, if you like, of Adam and Eve, um, what, it, what, what goes wrong in my life is that I think I, can, I think I can do it better. I think I can do it better than God. And that's where I go wrong, and that's where religion goes wrong. And that's where that is the heart of it going wrong, that I think I know better. Let's leave it there, and I'm sure there will be more opportunity later to do more of this.